Chapter 24 July 1914 Buying Time The Charade of Mediation Before the war, Sir Edward Gray's reputation rarely suffered from contemporary attack, no matter what he did. The secret elite protected him at every turn. The Foreign Secretary fronted their ambitions with absolute loyalty, and his reward was to be treated with reverence by the Times, King George V, the British establishment, and sympathetic international leaders. He was an untouchable. He was an he was an untouchable, the epitome of right-minded, educated Englishness, of impeccable family, and the best of clubs. Sir Edward Grey was held at such high esteem that his clever manipulation of the July crisis and his consequent misrepresentation of events to Parliament and to his cabinet colleagues was accepted at face value. The verdict of his time claimed that he acted splendidly in a great crisis and did everything possible to avert war. He did not. Grey delivered the war. His strategy from the 25th of July onwards was to make it appear as he sought answers to intractable problems by offering plausible solutions, and to urge the Germans in particular to cling to the hope that peace was still possible. Gray knew precisely what had been arranged by and through Poincare's visit. Sazanov and the Russian military had begun mobilization. His prime objective was to gain time for the Russians by delaying Germany's defensive response. He achieved this by presenting Britain as an honest broker for peace. Sir George Buchanan in St. Petersburg ensured that Gray was kept fully informed, thus allowing him to don the mantle of peacemaker to Russia's advantage. British neutrality sat at the, at the epicenter of this charade like a prize exhibition at an auction. Sazanov desperately wanted Gray to openly admit to the Entente, but to no avail. The Germans repeatedly sought clarification about England's intentions, but Gray held to the official line. Britain was not bound by any obligation to enter into war. He had told his lie. He had told this lie so often he might even have started to believe it. Over that weekend on the 25th to the 26th of July, while the Russians secretly began their mobilization, the British, poli the British political leaders left town for their country pastures. The German ambassador, Prince Lynchnowski, arrived unannounced at the foreign office with an urgent message from Chancellor Bethman, imploring Sir Edward Grey to use his influence at St. Petersburg against any form of no mobilization. No one was available to see him, and Lichkowski had to postpone his appeal until Monday. It was an old trick. It was an old trick in such a simple deception. By being allegedly out of touch for the weekend, formal di formal diplomacy was put on hold, and the Russians were gifted two more valuable days for mobilization. Gray's convenient absence. Stole, stalled Lichnowski, but did not in any way hinder the foreign office from repeatedly making diplomatic moves aimed at buying more time for Russia's military preparations. An offer of, mili of, an offer of British mediation was immediately accepted by Germany but rejected by Sazanov and Poincare. Gray then proposed that the ambassadors of Italy, Germany, and France should meet with him in London to find a peaceful solution to the diplomatic conflict. This offer was made in the full knowledge that Italy had long planned to betray her commitment to the Triple Alliance. Germany and Austria were themselves aware that it was very unlikely that the Italians would support them. Bethman believed that the ill will of Italy appeared almost a certainty. As matters stood, Germany knew she would find herself isolated at the conference and that the vote count was bound to be 3-1 to one in favor of Russia's view. A further stumbling block was the insistence that Austria accepted the Serbian reply as a basis for negotiation. No specific condition was placed on any other nation, and Russia remained free to continue her preparatory measures 
In truth, the conference was proposed not as a mean to find a settlement, but to give the massive Russian military machine time to move its armies up to the German frontier. Germany abdicated the eminently more sensible proposition that direct negotiations between Vienna and St. Petersburg offer the best chance of peace. Gray indeed, Gray agreed, but Sazonov did not, knowing full well that Austria had just declared the Serbian reply unacceptable. Sazonov said he considered it satisfactory and the basis for talks on which Russia willingly held out her hand to Austria. This was yet another of the peace proposals that Gray, Sazonov, and Poincare knew could never be acceptable. Forewarned that any peace proposals emanating from Gray was a ruse, Poincare and his Volsky knew how they were expected to respond. When Gray suggested a solution and Germany accepted, Poincare or Sazonov would say no. Likewise, if Germany proposed a peace move, Gray would accept and be seen as the man of moderation, but either Poincare or Sazonov would then reject it. War was the object, not peace. During that same weekend of the 25th to the 26th of July, with the British cabinet absent from London, Sir Arthur Nicholson in the Foreign Office kept his finger on the beating pulse of the European crisis. Across at the Admiralty, another secret decision drew war even closer. At four on the Sunday afternoon, the first sea lord, Prince Louis de Battenberg, who had been appointed to replace Jackie Fisher in 1912, sent with Churchill's prior approval an order to the fleet to remain concentrated at Spithead. Quietly and unassumingly, the fleet was mobilized. Note the coincidence, both the first lord of the admiralty and the foreign, and the foreign secretary were absent from their post. Yet key departmental yet key departmental decisions were taken that deliberately brought war even closer. As far as the public was concerned, nothing untoward was happening. It was just another summer weekend. Churchill and Prince Louis of Battenberg acted without the authority of the cabinet or the king but it hardly mattered since the entire British Grand Fleet just happened to be gathered at Spithead for the King's Review. The massed ranks of Britain's Navy had been effectively mobilized since the 15th of July, 1914. The official Royal Review took place on the 18th, but the fleet had not been disbanded back to its sectorial locations in the Atlantic, across the empire or closer to home in the North Sea had been mobilized in full view of Germany. What a magnificent deception. On Sunday, the 26th of July, Prince Henry of Prussia was at Cowes on the Isles of Wight, sailing in, magnificent, in his magnificent yacht, sailing his magnificent yacht, Germania, when he received an invitation to dine with King George in London. Henry was the Kaiser's younger brother and Grand Admiral of the German fleet. This was no chance meeting, but one primed by the secret elite to deceive the Kaiser. Over a private dinner, the king promised that we shall try to keep out of this and shall remain neutral. And reassuring news was telegraphed that same evening to Berlin. The king, like his late father, always played his part in the secret elite program that cut across the bonds of the extended royal families of Europe. Though the Kaiser and Prince Henry were his cousins, King George had no hesitation in maintaining the deception. Naturally, the Kaiser laid great store in the promise. Here was something infinitely more worthy than the huckstering of politicians. He had the word of a king. Every sacred moment was put in good use by the Russian military command. Over that same weekend, Russian frontier districts adjoining Austria and Germany were put on a war footing as rapidly as possible because the minister of war had the authority to call out the reservists and militia for service in those districts. This was carried out without the sanction of the Tsar. And so on the 26th of July, Russia's secret mobilization measures began in earnest. 
That very day, Sazonov assured the German ambassador, Count Portales, that no mobilization orders of any kind had been issued. He denied it to his face. The consequence of this deception would be clear later when Germany was taken by surprise by the rapidity by which the Russian troops poured into East Prussia. The French maintained their constant pressure on St. Petersburg. Prime Minister Vivani repeated over and over again that France was fully resolved to fulfill all her obligations to the alliance. Innocent though that might sound, the meaning was clear. He will stand together in war. We will stand together in war. Unspoken, but understood. He also reiterated the same urgent advice that Buchanan had passed on from London. The Russians had to proceed as secretly as possible in their military preparations to avoid giving Germany any excuse to reciprocate. Izvolsky sent an almost identical message. These men who posed as ambassadors of peace on the European stage were united in their shameless deceit. They sought war and in its pursuit to gain every advantage over Germany. Diplomatic proposals and counterproposals crisscrossed Europe over the next five days as a variety of options for mediation, negotiation, or direct interventions emanated from London, Berlin, Vienna, and St. Petersburg. Some were genuine, some were intended to deceive. Gray's suggestions were consistent in that they always supported the Russian position and never got any time sought to question or constrain Sazonov. More ominously, the Foreign Office began to insist that German preparations for war were much more advanced than those of France and Russia. No evidence from the British archives has ever been presented to justify this allegation. Britain had thousands of representatives, businessmen, bankers, tradesmen, and tourists in Germany during those crucial weeks. Military and naval attaches, councils in all the larger cities, and of course senior diplomats in Berlin all served to represent the interests of the British crown. No one filed an official report warning of Germany's of German preparation for war. The major newspapers had foreign correspondents in Germany. They observed nothing untoward. Not just that, no other diplomatic mission shared Gray's unwarranted view. The anti-German cabal of Gray, Nicholson, and Crow created yet another myth. The German government's view were published in the North German Gazette on Monday, the 27th. They voiced support for the Austrian action and strongly advocated a localized solution. Disturbing intelligence was steadily filtering into the German foreign office that Russian military actively had been in locations close to the border. 28 different reports became a cause for concern. The Danish foreign minister even went so far as to state categorically that the Russians were preparing to mobilize in military districts facing the Austrian and German frontiers. Prince Lesnowski asked Sir Edward Gray directly if he knew what was happening in Russia. Despite what he had already learned from Buchanan, Gray flatly denied that Russia was in the process of calling up reservist reservist. When Kaiser Wilhelm and his advisors returned to Berlin from their summer holidays on Monday, the 27th of July, there was a relatively calm atmosphere. General Helmuth von Moltek, chief of the German general staff, took the precaution of sending instructions to the German foreign office that would only be activated if peace negotiations failed. It was a draft of the ultimatum to be sent to Belgium in the event of war. Clearly he had to cover all eventualities, but neither he nor the Kaiser was planning to start a war. Molteki wrote reassuringly to his wife in the expectation that it would be a fortnight before anything definite was known. Such optimism, though a considerable misjudgment, was based on the German belief that a European war could be avoided. As far as Montecchi and the Kaiser were concerned, the most likely and certainly the desired outcome was a localized war between Austria and Serbia. Berlin officials felt vexed that Berchtold and Austria had failed to keep them fully informed and had delayed so long in taking action. 
The attitude of the Italian government, though not unexpected, remain un remain disturbing. Count Sizu Sizugini, Count Sizugini, the Hungarian ambassador in Berlin, noted that Italy, in the case of a general conflict, would not fulfill its duty as an ally of the Triple Alliance. He believed that Austrian demands on Serbia would be used as an excuse by Italy to avenge, to renege, to renege on its commitment. Vexation turned to alarm when four further telegrams arrived in Berlin revealing Russian troops moving movements close to the German border. The Russians had placed the town of Kovno in a state of war and mined the mouth of the Duna River. Despite the fact that her army would not be in position to invade for at least another fortnight, Austria declared war on Serbia Tuesday the 28th of July. In an instant, the diplomatic options changed. The Kaiser knew that Berchtel had to have his pound of Serbian flesh, but he was very unhappy at this sudden turn of events. Wilhelm had been impressed with the Serbian reply. In his judgment, the few reservations Serbia had made on particular points could be settled by negotiation, but he clearly understood the Austrian dilemma. In his eyes, as in theirs, the Serbs were Orientals, hence liars, tricksters, and masters of evasion. Having been obliged to mobilize twice in the previous two years against Serbian aggression, Austria demanded both the cast iron both a cast iron guarantee that Serbia meant what was said and recompensed for having to mobilize the army for a third time. He proposed a temporary military occupation of a portion of Serbia, the Kaiser's pledge. This tried and tested solution was similar to that which Germany had employed in France in 1871. Let the Austrians occupy Belgrade until Serbia accepted their demands, but stop at that but stop at that. There should be no full-scale invasion, but a qualified occupation that would satisfy honor all round. That would satisfy an honor all round. That would satisfy honor all round. The Kaiser went further. He took the initiative to put an end to this dangerous period in European history by stating that on this on this basis, I am ready to mediate for peace. Matters accelerated beyond Wilhelm's control, Sir Arthur Nicholson received a telegram from Buchanan stating that Russia had mobilized in the southern districts. Behind the scene, the secret elite were also mobilizing for the final push. They approached the end play on the route to war with meticulous, clear, with meticulous care. Lord Nathaniel Rothschild made an unscheduled visit to Prime Minister Asquith to advise him on the preparations that his bank had put in place to prepare for war. He had received the banker's order from his family's branch in Paris to sell a vast quantity of cons consoles to the French government, a vast quantity of consoles for the French government. This would have resulted in a substantial outflow of money from London to Paris, which he refused to approve. The stock markets across Europe were extremely nervous. Asquith confided this to Venetia, adding, It looks ominous. All agents of the secret elite were linked together through the most powerful advantage, knowledge, and they knew that the mobilization taking place in Russia meant war. They were fully aware that Germany would eventually be forced into a defensive retaliation through the Schleifen plan, and they knew through their bankers that the money markets were braced for the impact of war. Every shard illuminated aspects of the secret elite's foreknowledge. They knew because they were responsible. On the evening of the 28th of July, Chancellor Bethmann sent a telegraph to Vienna putting pressure on Birchtold to negotiate and immediately notify Britain and Russia that he had done so. Germany was cooperating to maintain the peace. Bethmann was doing all the... Bethmann was doing all he could to persuade to persuade Birch told to hold frank and friendly discussions with St. Petersburg. He informed the British ambassador that a war between the great powers must be avoided. 
Bethman was determined to make Austria reconsider the consequences of events that were unfolding, but by the following morning he had received no response from Berchtold. All that day he waited in vain for an answer. Berchtold's silence was unnerving. More and more reports were relayed to Berlin confirming Russia's mobilization. Motecki was able to report that France was also taking preparatory measures for mobilization. It appears that Russia and France are moving hand in hand as regards their preparations. There was much cause for concern in Berlin. The German military authorities demanded precautionary defensive measures. That evening, Bethmann indignantly fired off another three telegrams to Berchtold, adamant that there was a basis for negotiation. His subtext was that Germany's blank check could be canceled. The German ambassador in London telegraphed Berlin on the 29th to say that the British believed that a world war that a world war was inevitable unless the Austrians negotiated their position over Serbia. Lynchnowski begged Sir Edward Grey to do all he could to prevent a Russian mobilization on Germany's borders. The consequences would be beyond conception. Grey promised to use this influence and keep Sazonov as cool-headed as possible. Far from trying to calm Sazonov, however, Gray made no attempt at intervention. Instead, he met again with, with Lynchnowski that evening and sowed the seeds of confusion that deliberately included conditions and suppositions that mixed hope with dire warnings. Gray wrote four dispatches on the 29th of July that were later published as official documents in the British Blue Book. After the war, when some limited access was granted to national and parliamentary archives, it transpired that the telegrams had never been sent. It was part of a cosmetic charade to imply that Britain had made every effort to prevent war. Bethman and the Kaiser, on the other hand, genuinely tried to apply the brakes and gain some control of the deteriorating situation. The German Chancellor vigorously opposed any military measures that would ruin his diplomatic appeals. Unfortunately, he was almost the last man standing in that particular field. In Berlin, they held to the fading hope that British diplomats were men of honor, and great store was placed on the reassurance that King George V had recently given to Prince Henry of Prussia. The prince was convinced that the king's statement was made in all seriousness and that England would remain neutral at the start, but he doubted whether she would do so permanently. Germany pursued peace right up to the last minute. As Lloyd George later put it, the last thing that the vainglorious Kaiser wanted was a European war. His and Bethman's valiant efforts failed because the secret elite and their agents had already engineered their war. Sazonov anguished over the final decision. He was given to illness and depression, with mood swings and bouts of genuine self-doubt. If it was his weakness that initially attracted the secret elite to endorse his elevation to minister, it was also a problem that required careful handling. Sir George Buchanan was rarely far from his side, nor was Paleolog, the French ambassador. When the news of Austria's declaration of war on Serbia reached St. Petersburg, Sazonov was gripped by a dangerous emotional cocktail of fear, suspicion, pressure from the military, and the elation of possibly winning Constantinople. Concerned that Sazonov and the Tsar might lose their nerve at the 11th hour, or that the Tsar could be talked out of war by his cousin the Kaiser, the secret elite ensured that they received constant reassurance. The Tsar sent a desperate and revealing telegram to Wilhelm that gave a rare insight to his personal anguish. I appeal to you to help me. I foresee that very soon I shall be unable to resist the pressure exercised upon me and that I shall be forced to take extreme measures which will lead to war. Clearly, Nicholas II was overwhelmed by the pressure being put on him by the warmongers and was burdened by the realization that his actions not the Kaiser's, would lead to war. His telegram was essentially a cri de corps, a plea from his soul. 
the Kaiser was not impressed by what he saw as a confession of the Tsar's personal weakness, but Wilhelm's mind was also exercised by socialist anti-war demonstrations on the street of Berlin, on the streets of Berlin, which he refused to tolerate. He ordered martial law. These were indeed troubled and distracting times in many European capitals. The Tsar's telegram crossed one sent to him by the Kaiser at 1.45 a.m. on the 29th of July. Wilhelm advised him that he, as Kaiser, would do his utmost to induce Austria-Hungary to obtain a frank and satisfactory understanding with Russia. The telegram ended, I hope confidently that you will support me in my efforts to overcome all difficulties which may arise. His appeal was genuinely made and honestly intended. Germany continued to give time to find a peaceful solution in contrast to Russia, which was already on the move. During the afternoon on the 29th, Nicholas II caved into pressure and signed the order for the general Russian mobilization. As his telegram showed, he knew it meant war, but he remained ill at ease. Several hours later, following a personal plea from the Kaiser that Russian mobilization meant it would be impossible for him to continue to act as mediator for peace, the Tsar reversed his decision. At 9.30 p.m., urgent instructions were sent to the St. Petersburg Telegraph Office to halt the general mobilization. The Russian general staff were outraged at the stupidity of such a command. Allegations were later made that they continued the full program for general mobilization despite the Tsar's order. In fact, Russia had been in the process of, of mobilizing since the 25th, and the military had no intentions of losing their precious five-day advantage they had already gained. Intelligence reports citing Russian troop movements along her frontier were continually relayed to Berlin. Moltec could not afford to delay a military response for long. He was responsible for the defense of Germany, and it would have completely been it would have been completely incompetent to wait and see how events unfolded before reacting to the Russians. He was not fooled by their assurances that they had not yet mobilized or that no reserves had been called up. He warned the Chancellor that she, as in Russia, has been getting herself so ready for war that when she actually is issues her mobilization orders, she will be able to move her armies forward in a very few days. The Kaiser, however, did not want to give Russia, France, and particularly Britain any excuse to block negotiations for peace and overruled Moltec. In London that evening, the 29th of July, the secret elite's political placemen, Gray, Asquith, Haldane, and Churchill, held a private meeting to discuss what Asquith called the coming of war. The coming war. Apart from Lloyd George, these were the only senior British politicians who knew what was about to happen. Parliament in both houses was completely ignorant of the fact that Britain was going to war. Maurice Hankey, the secret elite's invaluable secretary to the Committee of Imperial Defense, advised them to declare a precautionary period on the road to war. Hankey was indispensable and at the center of all the major decision-making. He was the keeper of minutes, the organizer of instructions, the man who linked the center of the cabinet to the civil service. Churchill left the meeting, went straight to the Admiralty and ordered the British fleet to proceed immediately to war stations at Scapa Flow in the Orkney Islands. The Grand Fleet may have been mobilized in full view, but it passed through the Straits of Dover in total secrecy. There was no glory for the British Navy as it sneaked away in the dark of night with lights extinguished. Ten days previously, it had paraded with all flags flying before the King in a line that stretched almost 40 miles. On the 29th, while the Kaiser was working to preserve the peace, the fleets and armies of his op of his opponents were busily preparing for war. Chancellor Bethmann could see that Germany was being progressively surrounded by the proverbial ring of steel, 
and his ray of hope lay in the British government's announcement that it wanted nothing more than to cultivate friendship with Germany. How was he to know that it was simply part of Sir Edward Grey's deception? Bethman was left with no alternative but to put Britain's friendly overtures to the test. He discussed the critical European situation with Goshen, the British ambassador in Berlin, and detailed a number of promises that Germany would honor if Britain agreed to remain neutral. He was being honest and fortnight and fortright, qualities that were alien to the Machiavellian instincts in the British Foreign Office. And in his openness, Bethman gave a hostage to fortune. He was quoted as saying, provided that Belgium did not take sides against Germany, her integrity would be respected after the conclusion of the war. This was the moment for which the secret elite had been waiting. Goschen immediately telegraphed the German proposals to the foreign office. Sir Erie Crow, one of Gray's minders at the foreign office, reacted with affected indignation when the telegram arrived. His instant verdict was that these were astounding proposals that reflected very poorly on Bethman. More pertinently, he portrayed the German, can the German Chancellor's words as proof that Germany, Germany practically admits her intentions to violate Belgium. His intemperate language was mimicked by Sir Edward Grey, who rushed to Athquist to report that Germany had despicably tried to bargain Belgium's future against Britain's neutrality. In his memoirs, Gray recorded his despair when he read Bethman's dishonoring proposal. Despair? He felt nothing of the kind. Belgium had always been the answer. It was only a matter of time before the Belgian question would be raised, and witness to the vocabulary with which they rushed to damn Bethman's serious and honest proposals on neutrality. When he addressed the House of Commons the following day, Gray made no mention of the proposals from Germany that he and his advisors had already rejected. Bonar's law, the conservative leader, asked if there was any information that the foreign secretary could give to the House regarding the critical events in Europe. Gray replied, there is very little that I can say. He knew he could not possibly divulge the German offer, since a majority in the cabinet and the House of Commons would agree to neutrality and vote to keep Britain out of the war. Out of a war. If Russia wanted to start a European war over Serbia and her assassins, and France blindly followed, the most popular parliamentary view would have been to let them get on with it. Gray concluded, We continue to work to preserve European peace. It was a well-prepared soundbite and Bonar Law asked, to follow, asked no follow-up question. Neither man wanted an open debate on British... Neither man, wanted a Brit, neither man wanted to open a debate on British neutrality. Bonar Law knew far more than was made public. Several key members of Parliament supportive and of the supported by... Several key members of parliament supportive of and supported by the secret elite were in the conservative party and sat on the opposition front bench. Balfour was paramount, was paramount as the conduit between the party leaders trusted on both sides and absolutely at the heart of the secret elite. On the 30th of July, Asquith, intended, Asquith attended a secret meeting at Bonar Law's Kensington Villa together with, the, with Ulster Unionist leader Sir Edward Carson, ostensibly to discuss Ireland. The real purpose was to coordinate plans in the immediate run-up to war. The Prime Minister shared the latest intelligence from Berlin, which showed that the German government was counting on the Ulster's crisis to affect British foreign policy. They were given sight of documents from the Belgian ambassador who had reported that Britain was paralyzed by internal dissensions and her Irish quarrels. The most important was from the German chancellor, whose telegram was portrayed as attempting to buy Britain's neutrality. 
Asquith believed that this was clear proof that Germany expected Britain to remain neutral in the coming war because of the debilitating effect of a possible civil war in, in Ireland. It would be easy to forget that Asquith was sharing these secrets with his lover and leading and leaders of the opposing party, while men who should have been informed, members of his own cabinet, were not. The Secretary of State for Ireland knew nothing about this, for reasons that will be made clear in the following chapter. The Ulster representatives were given very special treatment and exclusively made party to the fact that war was imminent. Behind the backs of the mass of government supporters and a large majority of the cabinet, a cross-party cabal of secret elite placement was briefed in advance. The apparent runaway train that was Irish rule, that was Irish home rule, would have been would have to be switched to a safer track. But that would be arranged in good time. With trusted men on board, the secret elite could confidently start the countdown to the events that would bounce the British people into their long-planned war. In the meantime, Ulster was an impressive smokescreen behind which more than 1,000, 100,000 Irishmen could be turned into a fighting force right in the front of the Kaiser's eyes. Towards the end of July, Chancellor Bethman was the only European leader who sought to prevent war and find an equitable solution. On the morning of the 30th of July, both he and the Kaiser sent telegrams pleading with Austria to accept mediation. Birchtoll paid no heed to the advice. A very angry Bethman sent him yet another urgent message reiterating that Austria's intransigence, intransigence, intransigence was placing Germany in an untenable situation and insisting that Austria accept mediation. Bethman restated that he accepted Austria's right to seek retribution, but refused to be drawn into a world conflagration through Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary not respecting his advice. It was quite literally, it was quite literally a command. Desist. Berchtel was most empath emphatically being told to accept mediation. He had to give away or the so-called blank check would bounce and explode in his face. Berchtold finally realized that his plans for retribution against Serbia had to be revised within the parameters set by Germany. He had spent beyond his limit. With Berchtold at last prepared to negotiate, Bethman clung to a glimmer of hope that all was not yet beyond repair. Austria gave assurance that she would not annex any part of Serbian territory or violate Serbian sovereignty. And the Kaiser promised Russia that he would compel Austria to cease military operations and remain satisfied with the temporary occupations of Belgrade. Since the Austrian army would not be in a position to occupy Belgrade for another two weeks, there was still ample time for negotiations. If the Austrians agreed to halt in Belgrade, if Britain's friendly overtures were genuine, if the Austrians, if Gray put pressure on Sazonov to stop the Russian mobilization, peace was still within the bounds of possibility. If the Kaiser sent another heartfelt plea to the Tsar, would he agree to listen to his own cousin? Poor, deluded, hapless men. They had been deceived, all of them. Gray had no intention of restraining Sazonov or accepting any German proposals or preventing war. He had never, he never had. On the 30th of July, at 1.20 a.m., the Kaiser sent a despairing telegram to Tsar Nicholas, unequivocally placing responsibility for war on his cousin's shoulders. My ambassador is instructed to draw the attention of your government to the dangers and serious consequences of a mobilization. If, as appears from your communication and that of your government, Russia is mobilizing against Austria-Hungary, the whole burden of decision now rests upon your shoulders, the responsibility for peace or war. His cousin's appeal to reason struck a chord deep in those early morning hours, his mind uncluttered by the baying of warmongers, 
Nicholas made a bold decision to stop the madness. He telegraphed the Kaiser that he would send his personal em- emissary, General Tash- Tatishev, Tatishev, to Berlin with explanations and instructions that would broker a peace. Tatish- Tatishnev? Tatishev was the Tsar's own representative of the emperor's court, court, and as such, was outside the control or influence of politicians or the military. Tsar Nicholas's message held great promise, but Tatishev never made it to Berlin. Unbeknownst to the Tsar, Sazanov had him arrested and detained that night, just as he was about to enter his compartment on the St. Petersburg-Berlin train. It was an act of treason. Sazanov secretly defied the Tsar's express command and thwarted the highest level of personal diplomacy between the two heads of state. By hauling Tatichev off the train, he removed what would have become an awkward complication, one that could have stopped the war. It was a high-risk strategy and a high-risk game. Sazanov, urged on by senior members of the Russian military in St. Petersburg, begged the Tsar to ignore the German pleas. The telegram from Kaiser Wilhelm had clearly influenced him, but Sazanov insisted that they were a ruse, that the Germans were lying and trying to buy time to split the Russian and French alliance, and so to leave Russia vulnerable in a, to a devastating attack. Tsar Nicholas relented under the sustained pressure, and on that afternoon of the 30th July, again ordered general mobilization. This time, nothing would be permitted to stop it. Sazanov instructed General Janushkevich to issue the order, then smash his telephone and keep it keep out of sight for the rest of the day in order to frustrate any further attempt by the Tsar to countermade the mobilization. It was a conspiracy inside the conspiracy. Even action. Every action that could possibly be taken to continue Russian mobilization and bring peace talks to an end was approved by Sazanov and the military. A new era in world history had been sanctioned. In in Dobrolsky's own word, war was irrevocably begun, deliberately, willfully begun by Sazanov, point care and Sir Edward Grey, all at the behest of the secret elite in London. The Germans neither mobilized first nor rushed to mobilization when the news of of the Russian decision reached Berlin on Friday the 31st of July. Bethman had been desperately seeking confirmation from Vienna that they would listen to him and halt in Belgrade. So, giving the Kaiser the opportunity to stop the needless war. The time for diplomacy had passed. Moltec was naturally anxious. Restraint gave advantage to Germany's enemies, and these lay both in, to the east and west of the country. It was too late to avoid war. The official announcement of Russia's mobilization closed all doors to peace. The Tsar's order had been decreed while the Kaiser was putting severe pressure on Austria-Hungary to negotiate, and the British were secretly making their own preparations. The fleet was at war stations, and on the 31st of July, it was reported that thousands of feet tramped channel wards, regiments after regiment with full kit wound through wound through London streets as the bells from towers and steeples called the folk to prayer. In Whitehall, crowds parted to let a regiment march through. They marched on past the war office. They marched on past the war office and the Admiralty, but no one knew their ultimate destination. Thus the British Navy was mobilized and the army began mobilization before Parliament or the Cabinet had even had the opportunity to discuss the possibility of Britain going to war. The timing was choreographed to perfection. Within hours of Austria relenting to sustain German pressure 
and with the real possibility that successful talks could be held, the door to peace was deliberately, firmly, and finally slammed shut by the officials, by the official Russian mobilization. Kaiser Wilhelm sent another telegram to the Tsar on the 31st of July. He was hurt and disillusioned. His friendship and family ties apparently counted for nothing. While he was being mediated for peace at the behest of the Tsar, the Russians have taken full advantage and mobilized. The the Pifenig the Pifenig dot the the Pifenig dropped. His good intentions had been skillfully abused by deceitful men. Wilhelm had received trustworthy news of serious preparations for war, even on even on my eastern frontier. Wilhelm had received trustworthy news of serious preparations for war, even on my eastern frontier. Despite the fact that he had been deliberately misled and knew that his first responsibility was to his own people, the Kaiser tried once more to convince the Tsar that disaster could be averted. He warned his cousin that it will not be I who am responsible for the calamity which threatens the whole civilized world. Even at this moment, it lies in your power to avert it. Nobody threatens the honor of power of Russia. Nobody threatens the honor and power of Russia, which would be, which could well have waited for the result of my mediation. Every word was true. Russia was under no threat. Nicholas could have chosen to wait for a solution to the problem between Serbia and Austria. At the same time, Kaiser Wilhelm, the man who still stands accused of starting the catastrophic war, had made every possible effort to avoid it. One important measure of his inner feelings is how he responded to the news that war was inevitable. Was he elated, filled with unbridled joy? No. Was this the moment for which he had yearned? No. Wilhelm's, Wilhelm's anguish was clearly reflected in a note he wrote that day. I have no doubt about it. England, Russia, and France have agreed amongst themselves to take the Austro-Serbian conflict for an excuse for waging a war of extermination against us. The stupidity, the ineptitude of our allies has turned into a snare for us. The net has been suddenly thrown over our head and England sneeringly reaps the most brilliant success of her persistently persecuted, prosecuted purely anti-German world policy against which we have proved ourselves helpless. From the dilemma raised by our fidelity to the, venera to the venerable old emperor of Austria, we are brought into a situation which offers England the desired pretext for annihilating us under the hypocritical cloak of justice. And he was right on every count. He could, he could hardly have expressed the secret elite strategy more succinctly. Like a wounded animal caught in a trap, he realized too late that it had all been a setup. Around noon on Friday, the 31st of July, the Kaiser went to Berlin for a final conference with Bethmann and Moltec. At 1 p.m., he proclaimed the threatening danger of war. Not a mobilization, but a formal announcement that mobilization would take place within 48 hours. It was to be war. German military authorities needed to move fast. Their mobilization was based on the understanding that Germany, under attack from two sides, would have to advance firstly on France and then turn on Russia. Summary, Chapter 24, July 1914, Buying Time, The Charade of Mediation. From the 25th of July onwards, Sir Edward Gray's diplomatic efforts were geared to buy precious time for the secret Russian mobilization. Every suggestion he made over the next five days favored that. Gray abused his friendship with Lenchnowski by implying that Britain was unlikely to play any part in a ruinous war. The secret elite placemen made strenuous attempts to maintain an appearance of normality while secretly affecting every possible preparation for war. 
King George V was instrumental in deluding the Kaiser and his brother that England would remain neutral. The Foreign Office put about the lie that Germany was secretly mobilizing and better prepared for war than Russia and France. Several of the telegrams that Sir Edward Grey allegedly circulated to diplomatic contacts were in fact never sent. It was yet another part of the great deception that he appeared to make every effort to avoid war. Based on an expectation of British neutrality, Germany renewed Germany remained optimistic that a war between Austria and Serbia would remain localized, despite evidence of Russian movements on her border. Bethmann and the Kaiser became vexed with Birchtoll and the Austrians, who did not respond to their insistence that they should hold talks with the Russians. The Tsar wavered between a general and full mobilization in response to the pleas from the Kaiser to avoid war. But Sazanov and the military convinced him that delay was out of the question. While Bethmann in Germany was desperately trying to find ways of maintaining peace, and with Burstow constrained and ready to take a step back from, a from the precipice, the door was finally slammed shut in that option when Russia announced full mobilization on the 30th of July.